Uh, so, as I know, a number of people have, have registered who aren't going to be able to attend today. Um, but uh, but yeah, we are. Um, uh, it is, gosh, already mid October, and um, it's getting to be where next week is going to be the last expedition digging expedition for the season. It's hard to believe that the year is year has flown by. But um, with that, we're um, looking to uh, to next season and what we're going to be doing. So um, Henry Henry Anglin, who is the chair of the Memorialization Committee uh, for the Montpelier Descendant Committee, um, he and I are going to be talking to you all about what we're uh, what we're doing as a collaborative at the burial ground, both the surveys and memorialization. So. What I was going to do is, uh, Henry, Henry I'll, I'll, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, are you talking to me, Matt? I am. Good okay. Morning, Henry. <laughs> Good afternoon at this point. <laughs> Great to see you. All right. Um, uh, Henry Anglin, I am a member of the uh, Mount Pia Descendants Committee Board. Also, chairperson of the uh, the memorialization committee for the um, MDC. I um, I grew up in the uh, Mount Pelia area, right next to Mount Pelia. Uh, my uh, grandfather, grandfather, actually, actually I'm, getting I'm getting feedback, feedback for somebody. Some Are you hearing feedback? I, I took care of the feedback. There is some. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Um, my grandfather worked at Mount Pelia during the DuPont's time. He was a head carpenter there. My great great grandfather was uh, uh, enslaved there at um, Bloomfield. And um, he was one of the uh, individuals that. Um, basically started <laughs> the initial people that started uh, development and building air at uh, Jackson town. So, which is right next to Mount Pier as well. So that's, that's essentially uh, my background. Uh, have a lot of connections down there, went to school down there uh, all the way through high school at uh, Orange Graded School initially in Prospect Heights Elementary and then Carver High School. And uh, so I'm familiar with the area, grew up there and have a, 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 a great connection there to that area. And Henry and I have done a lot of running around in the area as well, especially around Jackson Town. Like, that one of my most memorable was the about three or four years ago where we went out and found the Jackson Town uh, schoolhouse location and looked at the burial ground there of your ancestors. Uh, in that's correct. To so that's but, correct, and also and also kind of connected with some of the families in the area to try to get additional information about the backgrounds of their uh their ancestors so you know we've done quite a bit of work there and been involved with some of the digs that now be in the past and this past uh, week as well yeah some good times so thank you henry mm -hmm. oh what i was going to do uh to begin is to um Set, give some in, an introduction to the montpelier burial ground um and what um uh, how we began, how we began to recognize it about four years ago as being a site that was much larger than we ever ever imagined it was. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, share screens. I'll, I'll give an introduction to this, and then Henry's going to talk about um, what we're doing with memorialization. But want to give the background and why the MDC is so interested in building a, a memorial there. And this comes from the archaeology that we've done. So I am going to share screens here, and hopefully you all can see um, the, uh, uh, the, the screen right here. Everybody can see the map. Every, yeah, OK, so the, is the map visible to everybody? Yes. Yes. All right. OK, so where the Montpelier burial ground is located is on the historic grounds of Montpelier, of course. Uh, this is a um, 
an overall aerial of Montpelier. And here's the visitor center uh, that you all um, uh, know. Uh, here's the uh, the main house over, over in this location right here. Um, and what we've got with the burial ground is it's just down the hill from the visitor center over in the, this area of woods um, that is, uh, um, you know, downslope from the main house in the visitor center. And for the burial ground, uh, when you approach the uh, Montpelier from the front, it's along the main house is this visible uh, grouping of woods right in this area, right off the, uh, right off the racetrack. Um, and we'll look what at his we've so what we've that. got with the uh, the burial ground and what we've recognized for years is um, that what was most visible in the burial ground uh, for many years are the depressions that are just right beside the sign for the burial ground. And this is a a photograph from uh, two thousand or, or like two thousand and three with snow and some of these grave depressions. And these grave depressions are all in this area right no, beside no, the- uh, um, no. I'm muting some folks as we go here, right beside the uh, the path. So here's the path coming into the visit, into the uh, burial ground area. All these blue um, uh, ovals right here, these are these gra the grave depressions that are, made very visible by this picture with the uh, the snow filling the uh, depressions. And what's most pronounced in this area, you can see this oval that's right here. This is a low mound that surrounds the, these grave depressions. And when you look at the LIDAR, this high resolution terrain mapping, what you can see is if I turn off the oval here, you can see this slight mound going around this area uh, right here. And for years, it was thought that this oval mound might define the extent of the burial ground. And um, so for years, when the burial ground was interpreted, it was interpreted from the sign that's right here. And when you went into the burial ground, what you would see was the interpretive sign talking about this small area right here. And um, about, oh gosh, it's, it's almost been, 10 years ago now, we started looking at a much larger area because when you look, this is the road that used to, to bisect what we know as the burial ground today. Here's the sign off to the right where the grave depressions are. I had done some oral history when I started here at Montpelier and an older gentleman, Buck Smith, recalled that when DuPont uh, farm workers would plow the field right in this area right here, they would come across long, long bones and skulls. And so what we did back in 2016 is we conducted a cadaver dog survey of this field and we found indication that there were um, uh, indication of human remains in this area. So we were able to get a, a grant to do um, a ground penetrating radar survey of this area of both not only the, um, the woods uh, in the area and the snowy picture of the, the GPR survey happening but then also we did a GPR survey of the field. And what that GPR survey revealed was that what we what was in this area, just like Buck Smith had related, is there were anomalies that were consistent with, um, with uh, 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 burials. And the, what the GPR detects is any disturbance in the, the subsoil. And uh, when these when the GPR is run, these transects are run in that case, back in 2018, we ran them every three feet. And if in two a neighboring transects, there was an anomaly that matched up, and in this case ran east-west, that was identified as a potential grave. So when they did this survey inside this dotted line right here, where it's shaded in blue, they found hundreds of anomalies but these were the only ones that matched up as being paired and that the, the technician could identify as potentially being burials. But when you look at the area where these the grave depressions are, what showed up as anomalies is only about, uh, about 25% of the grave depressions. So using this as a means to calculate the number of grave depressions we think that are in, in uh, uh, graves that are in this area, 
is we came up with an estimate of over 200 burials being in this area. And what it really indicated was that this site, you know, just down the hill from the, uh, from the visitor center in the woods and in the field was the main burial ground for the enslaved community at Montpelier. And this, of course, was made this even a more special place for the descendant community because they knew this was this this was the area where their loved ones were buried. And so this, you know, with, with this discovery, and we did the both the um, the ground penetra ground penetrating radar back in 2018, and the cadaver dog surveys in complete uh, collaboration with the uh, MDC with the descendant community. And what conversations started to come about at that point was how to memorialize this space. And that's where um, we've been working, you know, the MDC and the Montpelier Foundation has been working for the past three years to develop plans for this. And uh, that's where Henry comes in with the Montpelier, uh, Montpelier Descendant Committee and the Memorialization Subcommittee. So at this point, Henry, do you want to give a little bit about the uh, plans for memorialization in this area? And do you want me to leave the screen up right here? Or do you want me to stop sharing screens? Um, you can leave it up. I'm not going to really share a screen. I'm not an expert at doing that. So okay. I'll do mostly uh, talking. But you can leave that up for now because I think we'll come back to that a little bit later anyway. I also noticed that there are some other members of the memorialization committee on this call. I see Betty, I see um, um, Betty Kears, I see uh, uh, Diane uh, Gibson, I see uh, um, Yvonne, and I, I also see um, Rebecca Davis. So at some point, if you'd like to, if I'm missing something and not in, not in, not uh, uh, covering some things or you want to add to some things that I'm saying, you could just chime in as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main goals of the MDC is uh, is to memorialize the um, the individuals that were enslaved at Mount Pelia and the surrounding areas. Um, the, the Mount Pelia Descendants Committee, their vision is to provide a space to honor and share the history of ancestors and descendants. Um, we also want to develop the entire landscape, both natural, the trees and all of that, and also built as a site of you know, memory and, and memorial. Um, memorialization, as I see it, encompasses uh, mainly three things. Um, the cemetery itself, the landscape, and also uh, the community that surrounds the area in, in central uh, uh, Virginia. As far as the cemetery is concerned and, and memorialization, um, it, we basically want to, uh, um, uh, I guess some of the areas that we talked about is to res restore and preserve as much as possible the the cemetery of the enslaved. And that's what uh, uh, Matt has been talking about, trying to look at that area and, and to see what's present at, at this time. We want to identify the graves and the markers, and there are within that area, as Matt said, you see some of the grave sites, um, uh, but you are, there are also markers there that uh, help to identify the locations of those of, of those various uh, grave sites. Um, we want the story that we want the space to, to uh, tell a story about our ancestors and other relevant topics. Um, uh, we think that the memorials should be woven into the landscape and 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 as constructed should also probably um, um, as well as being built into the um, uh, the the area also air, uh, provide a certain amount of uh, uh, protection and we wanted to also the space to also tell tell the stories uh, said stories of relevant topics and the like um, the space we wanted to um, uh, be developed in a way that um, 
uh, we would honor those uh, that are buried there. We wanted to also be tranquil um, in in its design and the way that it's it uh, uh, provides an opportunity for people to come in and experience. I know people have in the past uh, come to those sites and um, have had a a profound connection with their ancestors there. And so it needs to be a, a space that's tranquil and gives the people an opportunity to 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 um, to really bring forth their feelings uh, in, in in that area. Um, uh, as we look at what we are thinking about as far as a memorial is concerned, uh, you know, in addition to those areas, it certainly has to be something that. Uh, should be sustainable and minimum upkeep and also be uh, uh, environmentally friendly as far as the the the, uh, the construction is concerned. Uh, we want the space to, we want a constructive space that uh, uh, reflects the enslaved ancestors' uh, sense of hope, their humanity, the cultural customs, the oral narratives, and and resonance. Um, at this particular point, we've had many discussions about ideas and possible uh, constructions, uh, but it's not finalized. Uh, what we need to do at this particular point, and we are at that point, is we're beginning to develop a plan to solicit uh, proposals from firms that are experienced in, in the area of uh, developing landscapes and memorials. Um, uh, those plans would be formal plans that will be provided by those firms as far as the memorial for the cemetery is concerned. Uh, so that's one part of what we're looking at as far as memorialization, the cemetery. We're also looking at um, the landscape as memorial. Uh, there are many other areas uh, throughout Mount Pia um, that we are looking at to provide a you know, landscape for memorial for, for the enslaved that, that tour there, um, that... Um, that sustained their livelihood and also contributed to the Madisons and and the nation and 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 as a whole. Um, uh, we want to interpret the landscape and Mount Pier as a site that provides educational and historical links to the enslaved of the enslaved to the Declaration of Independent Independence and the Constitution. We want to. Uh, again, look at uh, the history of the site, look at the background, and make sure that uh, visitors can understand the, the, the total picture of the contributions of the enslaved, as well as um, the, the Madisons and, and the other the families that lived in the area. Um, we want to, as far as the landscape is concerned, um, uh, we want to identify and connect descendants, um, both past, present, and then and we're talking about in the future as well, uh, of the enslaved communities. So we have a lot of broad uh, ideas of what we want to accomplish. We certainly um, want to be able to, within the landscape, uh, provide additional sources of information for those that are um, or, or viewing the sites, we might include things like placards and, and names of individuals that we may have that lived in the landscape um, and, and mark significant spaces, um, you know, such as maybe there's an area like the East Woods, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with. It's an area where um, at some point they were uh, tobacco growing uh, fields there. But then there's a, um, uh, a a canal that was built there to to help uh, with the irrigation of the tobacco. And that's still running today. You know, it's uh, something that's 
<laughs> survived uh, all those years and it's still still flowing at this particular point in time. So, you know, th those are areas that are important to Mount Pelia. It's important as far as the contributions that the enslaved uh, 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 contributed to. Um, uh, we want to we also, as we're doing this, we want to make sure that the 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 areas are really done in a way that's inviting, and we want to make it as much as possible interactive. You know, you have all of the nowadays. You have the you can utilize various types of uh, audio and visual kinds of uh, uh, things as far as exhibits is concerned, um, and we want to build those into um, the landscape as well as at the cemetery so that um, people will really understand uh, the significance of, of the areas that we are, we are looking at. Um, also, uh, the community is another area that, uh, that we are involved with and it's important uh, uh, we, um, as far as the community is concerned, we're doing uh, oral uh, investigations. We, you know, we are ha we have a person that's that's doing oral histories. Uh, that's the person that's on here, uh, Rebecca Davis, and she's interviewing uh, family members and to to get more information about the past and the connections within the area. Uh, if you think about Mount Pelia uh, and the enslaved at Mount Pelia, and you have many other plantations that are close by and in the central Virginia area, if you really think about that, you know, there was a lot of movement between of the enslaved between those various areas. And uh, the connections are, are, are grand, in those, you know, and and so we want to really uh, investigate and 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 develop a in a history of of those connections, and that's where the oral history comes in, uh, and it's and it's uh, uh, really important as far as what we what we want to do, and and also we what we want to um, add add to the area. Um, so we have the oral histor historian, I guess that's your title, uh, uh, Rebecca, and uh, she's really been involved with the community there. Um, so what we're really, we're talking about, as, as, you know, I mentioned that we're talking about this, the, this, the memorial at the cemetery, we're talking about the landscape as, as uh, memorial, and also getting the community and also working with the various communities, uh, ancestors of, of the enslaved in the various communities. It's various phases that we're involved here. You know, initially, you know, the cemetery is the, probably the, the newest and the most, uh, the, the phase that we're working on now, uh, but we will move into other areas as we go along. Uh, Matt had mentioned the fact that uh, that there is, and he'll talk a little bit more about this, about the uh, archaeology that's going on there at the cemetery. And that's really very, very important because as we develop our ideas and our concepts for the memorial, we want to make sure that that's located in an area that will not uh, 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 go into the areas where the actual grave, grave sites actually are. We wanted to be close by. And um, again, we have ideas about the concepts that we want to do. That's something that we'll develop as we go along in the next few months, actually. And especially if once we solicit the firms to, that we want to work with, we'll have to work with those firms to really develop the concepts as we go along. Um, so that's that's basically where we are as far as memorialization is concerned. I don't know, Betty, did you want to add anything? I don't know, but uh, uh, 
the, it's it's an it's an area and you know, when you when you when you were thinking about memorialization i'm thinking also that a lot of people think about monuments and that's not really the concept that we're looking at we're looking at something that's not a stone monument or anything like that but uh, something that really will honor those individuals that were enslaved at Mount Pia and buried there at the cemetery. And um, that's why when we're looking at uh, the landscape, we're talking about the contributions that were made and the connections that were, that were, were developed throughout that whole uh, area of Mount Pia and, and the surrounding communities. Um, I don't know if anyone has a question, but uh, that's essentially what we're talking about as far as memorialization is concerned. All right, thanks, Henry. And that okay. mo moves into, you know, what, what you were talking about, Henry, with memorialization is an incredibly important part of what's guiding the surveys we're doing this year in 2023 of the burial grounds. So since about May of this year, We've been working with the MDC on doing various surveys, and I'm, I'm going to talk about those next. And then those are going to lead up to excavations that we do in 2024. And what guides these is what the goals of the MDC has for memorialization of this space. And one of those is to um, look towards restoring the burial ground to what it looked like in the early 19th century. The other is to ensure we know the extent of the burial ground and don't do anything that would disturb that area with any, you know, any any uh, any work present or in the future to, to leave that ground um, untouched in terms of uh, any kind of, you know, memorialization or development. The other other thing that we've been talking with for years now with the MDC is, you know, what would take place with the archaeology. And one of the things that um, is very clear is that the um, for um, the next several years, if not forever, is that we would not do any kind of archaeology that would disturb human remains. So all the archaeology, both survey and any excavations planned, are with are going to be within the soil depth that's already been disturbed either by plowing or by historic topsoil, you know, just your normal topsoil. Uh, and so we wouldn't do any excavations that would penetrate more than eight to nine inches into the ground. And from the ground penetrating radar that we've done, indication is that the burials are greater than four feet. Um, and I'll, I'll show a little bit about that next. So what we're, um, uh, what we're looking to do with the, what we're doing with the surveys right now and go back to sharing screens here um, is uh, in 2000, like I mentioned, in 2018, we did the ground penetrating radar in the area that's shown by the white dotted line and this kind of blue hatching. And the GPR we did at that point was at the, the intervals were at three feet, which meant that it was very easy to miss uh, the grave shafts through the ground penetrating radar. And um, what we recently did in uh, June of 2023 is the area in red, we did a, a higher resolution ground penetrating radar survey in which we did uh, GPR every one and a half feet. And as you can see in this readout with the uh, geophysicist right here, um, this was back in June, you can see the, the readout here where you have burials is you have these anomalies that show up or these hyperbolas that show up in the GPR. And what the, the uh, geophysicists do is they plot those out. So the, the area in red is where we did the more recent ground penetrating radar survey. And what you see with the red dots right here are where they found indications of anomalies that uh, appeared to be burials. So again, the white is what was done in uh, 2018 at three foot intervals. Inside the red is the results from the June 2023 survey at one and a half foot intervals. And you can see there's a lot more burials that are indicated in this area by the GPR. And in fact, some of them are just amazing. They, you know, they, they run east-west as they should, but they line up in these north-south rows 
that are you, you just don't get lines like this naturally. These are you know these are um, human created anomalies. In this case, more than likely grave shafts. So what we're doing right now is. We're doing a, literally right now, we're doing a, a ground penetrating radar survey outlined in yellow. The state of Virginia just gave us a grant to do um, a, uh, a higher resolution uh, survey of the entire area. And this is a picture just this morning of the ground penetrating radar that's happening over the entire area, is we're doing the entire burial ground at a one and a half foot interval to try to understand you know, in in this space inside the um, this area of orange. So I've got too many, way too many um, uh, lines here. Let me turn off the uh, um, these guys. So we're back to this one inside. What's the yellow area here? We're doing a, a close interval ground penetrating radar survey of this entire area. And what we'll have is uh, hopefully by about November is we'll have a good idea of what the ground penetrating radar indicates in terms of burials uh, from the um, from the the readings from the GPR. Now, one thing ground penetrating radar technicians do say is that these should be tested ground truth, meaning the um, overlying topsoil removed to reveal the tops of grave shafts. And this is something we're talking with, you know, the memorialization committee about, and we're going to have a going to be doing having more discussions on that. Uh, but any any ground truthing again would be just removing those disturbed soils down to the top soil only within about eight to nine inches, and not disturb any uh, any remains. Now, some of the other surveys that we're doing, uh, like Henry, you were talking about the uh, the vegetation in this area. Obviously, this is a, a wood lot. And when you look at the um, the lidar for this woodlot, there's indications that there um, there's areas that were plowed because of the smooth landscape. And when you look at the terrain map, what you can see it's hard to see in this one, but there's a line that runs from the lidar down through the middle of the woodlot through this area. And what we found indications of through the metal detecting survey and a vegetation survey that we did is this area uh, to the on the eastern side of the um, of the woodlot looks to have been plowed in the late 18th, early 19th century. And the question is, is, is this did this plowing occur before or after these burials were in place? So these are some of the questions we want to answer through the archaeology. Um, the area that's on the western part of the burial ground over in this area appears to have never been plowed. And one of the, the main one of the one of the set of clues we found from this is through vegetation surveys. We've had um, a, a local group uh, do a vegetation survey plots of vegetation across the burial ground. We did a, did a spring ephemeral survey uh, back in May. And then more recently in um, in, Ju uh, in July or August, we did a, a full emergent survey um, with uh, Devin, Devin Floyd and then also uh, Michael Carter, who's also an MDC member and a member of the, of the memorialization subcommittee. And what we're looking, what th this team was looking for is evidence for intact vegetation from the period of the 18th and 19th century. And what they found is that in the woodlot in this area right in here, there is just incredible diversity of native flora that indicate that this area has never been plowed. And this is also further collaborated by when you look at this terrain map with the LIDAR, there's all kinds of hummocks and depressions all through this area that are very dissimilar to the smoothened area on this side that obviously is, has been plowed. We, during the metal detector survey that I'll talk about in one second, we found unqualifiable evidence in the form of a plow tip that was broken off in this area for, uh, for plowing. And one of the other things that we're looking at with the, with the vegetation surveys is we've done a dendrochronology uh, uh, survey back in June of this year, and we're uh, the dendrochronologist um, Dan Druckenbrod is coming back this weekend to take more samples with his class from uh, Ryder University. But we um, uh, did saw um, uh, cookies, uh, like Bruce, one of the volunteers, one of the guides here, took cookies from some of the down trees that the uh, dendrochronologist dendrochronologists are going to date. But what the dendrochronologist can also do 
is look at uh, not only date the 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 um, the trees from the number of tree rings, but then when you take these tree rings and you look at the size of the rings, um, when a tree is grown in an open area where there's lots of sunshine, the rings are very fat. And then when it's in a dense forest, the rings get much tighter. So what the dendrochronologist is able to do is actually give a forest history over the past 150 years for these trees. And there, some of the ash trees date back 140 years on in this woodlot. Um, and not only did we do um, uh, some of the, uh, you know, what, what the dendrochronologist also did is take core samples from some of the living trees as well. Um, what's interesting is the 1908 map shows this area in here as being a cedar thicket, uh, which does have some age to it. And the question that remains is, you know, how long has this area been in woodlot? And um, this is where, with the with the uh, metal detector survey, one thing that we're doing right now is um, doing a metal detector survey across this entire area. And those of you all that are familiar with Dennis, um, you know, know the work that that he's done. Uh, this is a picture taken this morning of Dennis doing, uh, you know, with a grid, ten foot grid. The blue flags here are every ten and a half feet. So what Dennis has been doing is marking hits on this 10 foot grid interval and then counting up those hits so we can get a density. And I'll show that map in a second, but then also sampling any near surface hits. So basically, you know, following along this, this, this um, uh, line of logic where we're only doing, we're only disturbing the ground within eight to nine inches, the only, samples that Dennis is digging are those that are less than eight inches in depth. And then furthermore, what Dennis does is when he finds a hit and excavates it, he photographs it in the field and then reburies it. And this allows any objects that are associated with, um, you know, surface memorialization from 19th century to remain, remain in place. Now, when you look at the map for the metal detector survey that's been done so far, yes. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the, when you look at the density of hits in this area, this is this, um, on the 10 foot grid, this area in here, Dennis is going to be doing a metal detector survey within this area of, of uh, orange, the, the orange dotted line. He's completed this area in here. And you can see there's only a few areas where there's a concentration. Uh, this area right here is interesting because what Dennis found here is a um, a uh, um, a cookpot fragment in the middle of a cluster of nails, and given that this location is within this field, you know the question that's begged is this a a cook cooking location associated with the agricultural operations of the field, or is this a cooking site that's associated with uh, one of the the burials that took place here, one of the uh, one of the funerals. Um, some of the other things that Dennis has located with the metal detector survey, and they were interested in um, in in looking at. Let me turn off some of these anomalies here. Is um, he's located uh, buttons, uh, and this um, the button that's right here. There's a picture of um, of Larry holding this button in its location. Um, this button that Dennis found, this has a, um, a star emblem on it. Th what Dennis says about this button, these buttons he's found in this area, is they're some of the highest quality 18th century buttons he's seen on the property. And this would go along with, you know, this would be on a, on a man's coat, uh, a man's coat button. Uh, if you've got have a funeral that's happening, people would be dressed in their best clothing. And as uh, um. Uh, Larry noted, who's uh, who he, Larry uh, Walker is a minister. He's officiated over hundreds of funerals. You know, people are hugging. That's the time when buttons could be um, could fall off a uh, fall off a jacket. So these buttons are, you know, indication of potentially, you know, the activities that were happening in this area. There's another one that was found up in this area right in here. And then in the middle of this, what Dennis also found, like I mentioned, this is in the area of this plowed field. Dennis found this uh, fragment of a plow that broke during plowing. And so this is a, a late 18th century plow. 
it gives indication that th this area in the eastern part of the uh, of the project was plowed um, on on uh, this side right in here. And what this also begs is, you know, whether there are fences that would have been placed to potentially protect or demarcate where the burial ground is. And so, for example, if I turn off the metal detector survey data here, and you see this line right here, Dennis is looking for any evidence for fences. This is would be in the form of nails that are in a lot in a uh, in a linear format, and then also fence wire uh, that might be present in the area. So, with the metal detector surveys, what Dennis is interested in locating is the evidence for fencing, evidence for activities that took place within the burial ground. And again, this is to allow us to have an idea of what happened in this space. And what we're, what we're going to be um, doing with the information from these surveys uh, over this um, for the 2023 season is this is going to inform what sort of features we're going to be excavating next year in 2024. And again, the goals of the excavation for 2024 are to understand what the burial ground looked like. Was it wooded? Was there, was, was there fencing that surrounded the burial ground? Um, are there uh, any indication of uh, grave markers, uh, you know, alongside, you know, the stones that we found in the area? Are there also brick grave markers that we find on the surface? So when Dennis is doing this gridded metal detector survey, one thing he's doing is mapping any stones that are part that he, he finds in this area. And in fact, where these anomalies were located from the um, from the June survey right in here, he did find stones in this area that are very similar to these quartz stones that show up in the um, uh, in the area where the where the grave depressions are. So we're looking at a whole bunch of different lines of evidence, you know, to inform our excavations that are going to take place uh, next year. Um, and again, we're, we're in discussions with um, uh, Henry's committee, the memorialization committee to decide, you know, what takes importance? What, what, are, what are the features that we're going to be investigating? And then um, how, you know, we, we go about with expeditions uh, doing this work. Um, but again, kind of the guidelines for this are we're, we're not going to be disturbing any human remains whatsoever, and then also doing excavations to understand the extent of the uh, of the burial ground. And Henry, would you want to add anything yeah. else to this? Yeah, I, I think one other thing that I should mention is that uh, uh, the decisions that are made as far as the the cemetery is concerned, the burial ground is concerned. Um, it's very important that the descendants are the ones that make the, the final decisions and work closely with the archaeologists and all that. It's 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 their ants their ancestors are there. They are the ones that need to make the uh, the major decisions as it relates to that. And that I think should apply to any similar burial grounds anyplace else. And uh, that's one of the things that we've emphasized and we've worked closely with Malpia and um and and it's and and we've got a good relationship as far as that's concerned. And any and and then additional um decisions in the future about the uh, cemetery. Uh, again we'll reach out to the entire um uh, Malpia descendants community to uh, to 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 make those decisions, and that's that's very important, and and it's and it's being done at this point. And that that's become a defining aspect for our department as the archaeology department is, rather than doing yeah. just straight research archaeology, we're doing what's termed in the field as community based archaeology where we as archaeologists have the technical skills to investigate sites such as the Montpelier burial ground, but we're guided by the de descendants and their questions the MDC has about their uh, ancestral uh, burial space. And another incredibly important part of this that we're really excited about is the work that Becca Davis is doing with oral histories and how they're, how they're, what information is out there 
about home place burials, such as you know the the Montpelier burial ground, that we should be looking for evidence for in the archaeology. Like, in, for example, are, what sort of traditions are there out there for grave offerings at um, these sort of areas? And we we did a um, a tour of the burial ground um, last week and. One of the things that was talked about during that time, uh, Bruce Monroe brought this up, is the differences between a burial ground that is in a space that's not officially recognized as a burial ground, such as the uh, as a as a uh, burial ground on a plantation, as compared to a burial ground on a church, where it's expected that burial ground is going to be present, and what. What Bruce said is in his notes that he's seen is periwinkle is often present at these home place burial grounds and discussions were had as to whether the periwinkle is a plant that basically is you know, the ancestors are using to say we are here, we are present. And so, you know, with the archaeology, this is where, you know, we're, we're combining both traditional archaeological techniques where you, you think about with the metal detector surveys and ground penetrating radar with the vegetation surveys, because those are part and parcel. And one of the things we also want to look towards protecting is the vegetation in the burial ground. Uh, and this is something, Henry, I think you, know, you stated that the, the, the vegetation and the natural area are an incredible part of memorialization. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's a part of the memorialization, I mentioned it briefly, but it's, it's the whole educational component that we're, we're proposing that uh, we work with schools and uh, communities and, and, and the like to make sure that we get that information, get them involved and also to share any information we have with them and, and, uh, and move forward with that. So that's the education part is a, is a huge thing. Um, for the surrounding areas, and also probably it was extended to the national as well. So that's important as well. Well, Henry, in the time we've been talking, there's a whole bunch of questions that have appeared in I the chat. I noticed some of them, and I think you answered some of those about uh, about to what extent we would uh, we would go as far as the burials are concerned i think you answered some of those we're talking um not uh, exhuming anything <laughs> we're mm -hmm. talking about just you know just uh uh, uh really uh, uh really trying to locate the actual sites themselves and not, and not necessarily doing anything beyond that that was one of them i'm trying to think of the other ones um um, yeah, essentially, Henry, what we're doing is, like you say, is we're doing doing landscape archaeology of the burial ground, understanding how it how it appeared. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, for the um, Melissa's, you know, there's one other. I'm looking at one other thing here. Um, let's see. It has to do with memorials in different areas. You know, one of the things that we want to do, and again, it's different phases of this and depending on the fundings that we get, um, we would like to end up with a, a memorial um, at, the, at the cemetery site that has those things that I talked about earlier, but go beyond that and end up with a, a memorial that we could really tell the history of the enslaved. And it'd be uh, uh, something that would resonate nationally as well. Um, reading a few more of these things. Raquel had a had a uh, really great question. Uh, she asked about um, uh, Mr. Engelin. You were speaking about how the committee wants to make a memorial space that is protective. Would love to hear more about what that looks like for you. Um. I, 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 well, when I say pro protected, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but when I was mentioning that, is that um, you want a space that would um, provide individuals that want to come and pay their respects and really um, um, connect with their ancestors 
um, you want to have a site that's um, built into that that uh, that environment. But when I said protected at that point, I was talking about one that uh, would be protected from the elements, so that you could do you could you could be there at any particular point in time. Uh, we are, I guess you could also talk about the fact that uh, as far as protecting the site itself, we've had discussions about that uh, to make sure that the site was protected from this point forward. Um, and that's something we're working on as well and to make sure that that, that site would, would remain as it is into the future. So that's another another part of it that we're working on, and uh, as far as easements and things like that are concerned. So, and that's going to be an incredibly part, important part of the archaeology that we do is how, you know, when we, when we do the archaeology in the space, how we organize our screens, our tents, that sort of thing, and do that in a way that is respectful to to the space. Looking through, I think we covered Henry. I think we covered most of the. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's some additional things there. Yeah, Melissa asked, "Is there any concerns about human interference?" We don't. I mean, the the one interference that we have seen is from plowing. Uh, there, there is uh, definitely on the the western part of the of the burial ground that was plowed in the late 19th and early 20th century. So that's the. That's the main disturbance that's happened. And the question that we have is, did any of this plowing occur during the Madison period? And that's um, part of, uh, you know, some of the investigations we're going to be doing because there is a fence line that runs right through the middle of the burial ground that dates to the 18th century and how that coincides with burials and the dates of the burials. That Was that a, 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 a plowed field that was... Uh, later, um, after the plowing ceased, the burial ground expanded into that area, or was it part of the burial ground that then was taken over by the by the uh, enslavers to be plowed and made into agricultural fields? And this, of course, um, you know, speaks of the the erasure of the community uh, on the landscape. And this is, um, a history that African-Americans have had for, for centuries. Uh, you know, think of the, um, the, uh, bypasses that go through towns. I mean, there's not much difference. That's one of the discussions we had last week in the tour. And one, one thing that's been so informative, Henry, is doing the tours and discussions with descendants being present. And that's what we're so excited about with this archaeology is to do the work in conjunction with the descendant community, uh, because there's just so much more that's offered than a straight scientific approach is bringing the humanity and the hit the community history into the archaeology. I think that's going to make this the, the richest form of investigatory project that we've ever done here at Montpelier. I'm very excited about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just jump in real quick? Absolutely, Becca. Awesome. I just wanted to kind of add another element to the uh, question that Raquel um, answer, or asked, rather, not answered, my goodness. Um, we, in terms of uh, the vegetation um, survey as well, we were talking during the memorialization committee, we were also talking about the fact uh, that we should probably um, consult Native American, uh, a Native mm -hmm. American expert um, on vegetation because that area, that one specific area in the burial ground would have been untouched for who knows how long. I mean, we all can agree that Native Americans were living on this site long before any of us um, or Madison's or their enslaved were there. So um, I think that it's important that we also include the Native American aspect into the narrative because there's not, the, the timelines are a little squishy. There's not really a definitive Native American occupation ends here and Madisonian starts the, at, on the other side of that. So, so yeah, we're just trying to be as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the, the uh, Native American knowledge of plants would work into that, absolutely. Mm -hmm.
Any other questions that rise to the surface? Thank you for that, Becca. Also, we had talked about um, as far as um, the educational part of some of the history is concerned. We'd also talked about it somehow um, including as a grand part of the memorialization um, writings uh, from Madison and and Dolly Madison and James Madison and those things that are related to the enslaved and the um, uh, the 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 their feelings about about the enslaved the, uh, the 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 things that were going on at that point. Um, so it's a, a huge task to try to include and not overdo <laughs> include. Um, uh, relevant information that uh, that would tell the, a, a more complete story. Uh, well, it's exciting what we've learned so far, Henry, and where we're at with memorialization. This is uh, what's really, I feel significant about this in many ways is the construction of a memorial will be the, the the first time descendants have had a voice in what how this space will be will be recognized, and uh, that's something that um, uh, you know with the archaeological investigations we're doing, uh, we're hoping to um, you know provide the maximum amount of information possible for what this area looked like and how it how it can be restored. We'll be able to move forward. Uh, we're trying to develop an RFP at this particular point in time to really start moving forward with that. And um, um, it's a task to, to to develop a good RFP to get the uh, firms that we need to work with us to do that. And we'll have more information about that a little later on as we go go forward. Mm -hmm. Matt, yes. What are you looking at? A, a, your timetable. What? How? How? How much time do you have? I guess is what we're asking. Is someone expecting you to be done in a year, or or that? Well, for the um, uh, for the our first, if you're looking at a timeline, our first goal is to define the extent of the burial ground. And uh, do and ensure that the uh, for memorialization we know where the burials are and where they're not because that's going to inform you know how the memorial uh, space will be planned and designed and so that um, we're hoping to Henry I, I guess the timeline for that is we're hoping to have that be done by the um, the spring of 2024 or is that uh, sooner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that part is done by the spring of 2024. Um, we'll start working with firms in 2024. Um, probably it, it needs to be completed by 2026. So yeah, it sounds like a long way away, but uh, it's a lot to it's do not. in that particular period of time. Yes. But the firms will start, you know, when we when we identify the firms to work with, we'll 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 be able to move forward a lot quicker. And but again, the the timeline, the the completion is in 2026. Marilyn, I see you have your hand up. Well, I I just wanted to say this is so exciting to see this happening. I've been ever since. I visited Montpelier back in 1927. Uh, 20, it's been a love of mine to have uh, people, uh, enslaved people, uh, have a voice uh, and, and descendants have a voice. And I was in Ghana. Uh, this past summer, spent a couple weeks, and uh, one of the things I did was visit the, the Cape Coast and another collection point and the dungeons and walk through the door of no return. And it was 
really scary, even though I knew I could return, but I found out that there were specific ships that were going to Virginia. And it struck me that there was a distinct possibility that people passed through those very places on those very stones that I was walking ended up in Montpelier. So I could easily have been walking on the very same ground that it brings tears to my eyes that I could be there on both continents and my heart goes out to you. Thank you, thank you, Carol. Thank you. Yeah, the the in the space of the burial ground certainly is a witness to that. Absolutely. Well, we're at one o'clock. Betty had a question. I don't know if anyone else can has any additional information. She had a question about um, trying to find out when the state people call the sites where they buried their descendants. The actual what they actually call. Um, the sites and she's and, and she was wondering if anybody on the call had any additional information about that i don't know yeah we're calling them cemeteries and burial grounds but i would like to know what the enslaved people call those sites because they're very very important you know to the enslaved communities and the other part of that was, was there anything in the way of a, a church, whether it was a building or just a, an area of where they would hold a, a very specific ceremony? Um, we think of, of the burial grounds being at the church. And I'm sure these, there probably was no church built out there in that typical, that, you know, like a grave site just a gravesite service. So I was just curious if there's been any indication that there was something out there that was said, this is where they would have held a ceremony and then a burial. So Betty, you had uh, an experience, didn't you? you? You talked about an experience in the past that kind of ref reflects that. I think uh, you're referring to my going to an, an outdoor Easter service. Yes. It was an outdoor yeah. chapel. And so it was a knoll surrounded by tall, leafy trees. And um, it it was not a, a building at all, but it was an outdoor chapel. The, the uh, There was sort of a ceiling, if you will, which was the canopy that partially hid the sky above, but allowed light in that, um, you know, was just, it was very radiant and warm and it, it brought together a community for a specific service. Now this was an Easter service, which in a way is a burial commemoration, mm -hmm. right? But perhaps there was something in the environment, in the natural environment, that de designated a, a special location to honor those people they were putting into the earth. An indication is, is that the main part of the burial ground has always been a woodlot. So that would go with what you're saying, Betty. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we're talking about, incorporating that into the memorial at the cemetery. When we talked about the natural environment and the trees and the periwinkles and mm -hmm. being able to uh, incorporate that into uh, what we're looking at as far as the memorial is concerned. I just want to comment on how many people were in this meeting. I think what I saw up on the participant count was as high as 83. Mm -hmm. So that says to me, you know, we have archaeologists, we have descendants. 
Um, we have scholars and I don't know everybody's background, but what it does say to me that um, Americans who care are recognizing that um, enslaved people were also unrecognized founders of this country. Now, I'm, I think I'm butchering a term that was coined by James French. Maybe it was invisible founders. Mm. Well, uh, what the term is saying is how important enslaved people have always been to the founding of this country and the, the success of this country, especially in the area surrounding uh, Montpelier, which we're calling the arc of the enslaved communities. But, you know, I'm just so um, pleased and grateful that, that so many people are, are coming together to, you know, recognize how important enslaved mm -hmm. people were. And yeah, I was looking at another comment here. Yeah, water has played a part in, in a number of areas that, uh, as far as um, burials are concerned, I mean, even in that area, if you think about it, and we're talking about a, a serene area, where you have the trees and the prairie winkles, and you're also talking about the birds in the background and the sounds of the birds and things like that. All of that can contribute to what we're looking at as far as uh, a, a place to honor those who are resting there. Well, Betty and Henry, that was a beautiful way to to end this uh, this, this discussion. So, but thank you all for being here today, and uh, Henry especially, thank you for um, uh, giving us you know information about the memorialization. And um, as we get uh, as we work with the MDC on developing the plans and the goals for the 24, 24 excavations, we'll be sharing that with uh, with you all. So, but in the meantime, thank you so much for attending today. Um, and um, I'll, I'll send the recording out after this download. So thank you so much and hope to see you back here at Montpelier very soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>